Welcome back. You lot have been asking me a lot of questions. Questions such as what welder do I use, what gas do I use, and how do I restore a car in such a small workshop? Well, today's video is all about answering those questions. So the thing we'll start with is what everyone's kind of really been asking is, why Makita or why do I use only a certain brand of power tools? For me, as my day job, obviously I was an electrician and I had power tools. I did try DeWalt, my van got broken into and then I replaced it all with Makita. Now, Japanese, I believe, absolutely fantastic, especially the brushless version. You've probably noticed in a lot of my videos lately, the only tool I've been using is a grinder. Now that's because we're doing body work, but this, this thing is probably five years old. It's been absolutely hammered and it's still got life in it, touch wood. The majority of the power tools I own are more biased towards the construction industry, such as SDS drills, circular saws, and so on. It doesn't really warrant me showing these on this channel. Who knows, maybe I'll feature them on the Signature Builds channel instead. My advice with power tools is if you feel like you're going to use them, especially if you're doing a car or any DIY work, buy what you can afford. For me, the best way to get into buying power tools is to not buy them one by one, because when you get down the line, you'll think, bloody hell, I've spent three times what I could have paid just for a bundle. There is a lot of bundle sets around now where you get five power tools, you get a double charger and three batteries for around 600 pounds, I believe, that's Makita. Then what I tend to do is buy everything body only. And what that means is you buy it without a box and a battery and it comes like this, and you just use the batteries that you've got. That's where the money is, the batteries. They're about 80 quid each. I think I've got about six at the moment just because I fly through them and I just want everything to be interchangeable. So hopefully that'll answer your power tools. They're all just about as good as each other and it's just preference really. Try and stay with the same tool and that way you're not having to mix and match batteries and have loads of different chargers plugged in. Moving on from power tools, we'll go on to the workshop tools. Now you'll probably notice this pillar drill behind me. This was quite a recent new addition and it was from Aldi, believe it or not. Aldi tools are made by a company called Ferex, which is actually a company owned by Einel, and the warranty on these for alone is three years, and as from what I've heard, I could pretty much throw that on the floor, smash it, and get a new one. So that's why I went with that. It was 59 pounds. It's handy for when I need to you know, like widen holes and things, punch a few holes in metal, but I, I don't use it a lot, but when I do use it, it is very handy, and the problem is it does take up quite a lot of space, but for 59 pounds, I couldn't argue with that. Quite a few of you have asked what air compressor do I use? Now this is a 50 liter SGS engineering air compressor. I'll leave a link to it in the description and there will be affiliate links. If you do click it, I get a slight kickback from it. Nothing major that will put me in a bigger workshop anyway. But with air compressors, now it's all about CFM. Now CFM is the flow rate and this doesn't have a great CFM. It's okay for spraying the odd bit and being on and off the trigger, but if you want something you can literally just squeeze the trigger on and the air, con the air output stays the same and stays constant and doesn't dip, then this isn't the thing for you. This is just basically a hobbyist air compressor. It's great for blasting air and doing the odd bit of spraying. And it's also direct drive. Now with it being direct drive, it means it's very loud, as I will now demonstrate. So as you can see, stop that right there. But obviously talking about air compressors moves us on to air tools, which I'll show you the air tools that I use. I don't use very often, but they are very handy when it comes to the point that you actually need to use them. A quick whiz through the air tools. We have an SGS air cutoff grinder. That was actually nine pounds. How they make that for nine quid, I will never know. We have an Amazon special finger sander. I think that was 20 quid. Great piece of kit, 20 pound, can't complain. This was the most expensive one that I bought. And this is a Clark hole punch and flange tool and puts a flange in the metal and punches a hole. I will demonstrate this in a second. And then we also have obviously the tire pressure filler from SGS. We have the blaster thing, whatever that is, and then we also have just the air clean-off tool. I've just realized I've told an absolute lie. That 
isn't the most expensive air tool I've bought. There's actually an air tool I've got which is quite big, but it's at the house in Wales. And it kind of ties in with the question that someone's asked, saying, do I have a blast cabinet for cleaning parts? The answer to that is no, but I do have a sand blaster. Again, it's a Clark sand blaster. You probably guessed Machine Mart, so we're one of my favorite shops. So Machine Mart, if you're listening, give us a plug, give us a bit of sponsorship. It basically looks like a, a, a propane gas cylinder. You fill it with median or sand, but we don't use sand because of silica dust. So you use median in it, which is like a sand compound. You put the air line to it, and then it comes out at 120 PSI and blasts the rubbish off items. I can't demonstrate it because it's in Wales. A blast cabinet would be the best thing for me to clean parts, but sadly I don't have the room, so when it comes to cleaning parts, I just go to the powder coaters, I take them a box and I go, what deal can you do me on that? Nine times out of 10, if it's a box a load of stuff, they'll probably say give me 200 quid and it'll come back in the colors that I want. I'll show you how I manage in such a small workshop because it's an absolute nightmare. In fact, it's that much of a nightmare that I actually have to move the car over just to get the weld around to the other side, which I will demonstrate. Now, I think the best way to do this is to switch to selfie mode. A while back for the, the long watchers of the channel, you'll realize this garage actually never had timber doors that end and timber doors this end. Now, the reason for that was it was always going to be a temporary build and then I managed to squeeze a bit more out of my mum and say, look, can I just extend the garage? She said no and it kind of happened. This garage was also a metre shorter in both directions and I did extend it. So it is a tight space. The reason for the doors was because I was sick of unscrewing this tarpaulin every single time I wanted to come and work on the car. It was dripping water in and it just become a ball lake. So originally the build was about £150 to make this shed. You're probably close to 300 now by the time I've messed with it. But, you know, it's it's done the job. It's kept me in the garage for two and a half years. And I really, really can't complain because it's worked. So, yeah. Where this floor in is, and where that timber stud is, and where that metal clad socket is, apologies for the shoddy wiring. Again, it's temporary. I don't care. Um, and where that support was, that was like the end of the garage. We then extended it this way to add that, add the door, and that leads us out to the back. And the same goes for this end. From where this strut is, all this didn't exist. We added it in. Me and my granddad made these double swinging doors that I have, haven't been open for quite some time. And yeah, it just allows me to get the car in and out. Not that it's been out of this garage for about three years now, and it's been sat on a rotisserie for two. I just mentioned the word rotisserie. Now you're probably thinking that's what chickens cook on, but no, this is what my car gets welded on. Something that I made, and I am aware that you can buy them for probably around a couple of hundred quid, but I was new to welding at the time and I thought what better way than to throw myself in at the deep end with it being life or death that if these welds fail and I'm under the car, I'm brown bread. So I'll demonstrate with this now. I actually made this rotisserie for about 65 quid plus a few bits of welding wire and you know some flat discs. So we'll call it 70 quid all in and it's enabled me to move the car around, spin it upside down, and I've not got to lie on the floor getting covered in spats off the welder. Now, you're probably all watching this video thinking, Tom, everything you've shown me so far costs a fortune. Can I get into this? Yes, you can, because I have not bought all this in one hit. I bought the car and was like, shit, shit. I now need tools. I was like, well, tools cost this much. And it's like, well, I'll buy one and do this one job, and then I'll buy the other and do that one job. Until eventually I've ended up with so much crap, I can't store it anywhere than other, other than three garages. Two of my mum's, sorry, four garages. Two of my mum's, one of my dad's, and one of my nan's. God help it when I move out. Do you remember when I spoke about size of this workshop and how much of a ball like it is whenever I want to move the car or do anything? Right now you're about to witness that all the stuff I have to move just to spin this car upside down. So cue the timelines. <laughs> So hopefully you can see, it is an absolute chore to get this car on the side. And just to show you what space we've got here, I don't even think it's a meter for me to, like, you know, go between. I mean, you can see, like, it's 890 mil from the car to that wall. There's not a lot there. So by the time I've got my welder here, and you're trying to weld and you're tripping over stuff, it's a ball leak. And that's why the airlines are strapped to the wall, just because I need floor space. 
is very limited. It is 5.1 meters. And the car obviously doesn't have a front end at the moment. So let's guesstimate that is Three point four meters. So I've actually got less than two meters between this wall and that wall to mess around with and move all my stuff. People say, "How do you cope with a small garage?" It's patience. I've not got a lot of that. But in all seriousness, the width of the garage is the major one that's a killer. So I'll just push the tape measure here. You can hear it, so you can believe that I'm doing it, and you can see it. It's oh, I tell a lie. It's two point four meters wide. How wide's the mini, I hear you ask? Let's find out. They're just gonna love messing with a tape measure. It's 1.4, so I actually have 500 mil either side. You work that out, that's less than a ceiling tile that a light fitting goes in in a commercial building. No one cares about that, Tom. I'll stop messing around. I'll show you what welders I use. I'll show you what welding products I use. And hopefully this will give you some insight into what to buy. No pro, just all of recommendations. Come on. We have the Clark 135TE MIG welder. The Clark 135TE turbo MIG welder, whatever you want to call it. Great piece of kit, recommended by a friend of mine. Not so expensive, but kind of expensive at the same time. 299 from Machine Mark this. It's a gas and non-gas welder. Now, welding without gas is catastrophically shit. Shit. So, I use Argon CO2, and it's a 95% mixed blend, whatever you want to call it, and I get my gas from BOC. I find it's great to weld with, but it has its limits. This can only do a uh, 4mm to 4mm plate, and it struggles when it goes that high. Um, so I will be upgrading it in the future, but this, to do this car, it's, it's more than great. In fact, I'll give you a quick demo of what happens with when you weld with gas and when you weld without gas. Right, so now we're down to this demo of obviously gas versus non-gas welding. Uh, the welding mask I'm going to use is just a Deco Super Weld Free mask. This was about £80 and the reason it was so expensive is because the viewing window is a lot bigger than your £20 masks. The tip to weld in, again I'm no pro, but what I found is if you're comfortable and you can see, you weld a lot better than when you're trying to look for a little visor and it's steaming up every two minutes. So if I just throw this on, one second, and we'll do a little test weld. You don't want to go too much, but if I just bring the camera closer. So that's a weld with gas, and that's a butt weld. And as you can see, there's clouding on both pieces of metal, showing that the heat is transferred into both. And if you actually look at it, it's a bit like a moon piece. Now it's obviously it's bubbled outwards. Obviously that's going to be quite hot. Now I don't know if you can see, but that's kind of what it looks like. If I spin it around, you can see we have, if it focuses, we have the same amount of weld on both sides and that's what you call penetration. You should never have it where you have a bubble on one side and nothing underneath. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to whip the gas off, so I'll screw the bottle all the way out and you'll hear it go away. Ready? No gas now. What we will just use is good old electricery. The spats are ridiculous. It's more like a moon paper. Now, for someone that's obviously an amateur at welding, I don't condone these are the best welds I've ever done for one second. But if we just release the butt weld clamp, which I will come on to shortly about clamps and tricks and stuff, you can see here all the welds. Now, the ones where it bubbles, the camera will focus on that. You can see how it looks like a moon crater, especially on this top weld here. That's without gas. Now, not only does it look shit, I think it doesn't look strong at all. And as you can see, the first one to break out of all those is the gasless ones. Completely broke away. 
So anybody that uses a gasless welder, you're pissing in the wind if you ask me, because that, that's shocking. The other form of welding is spot welding. Now I do have a spot welder, and again, I will show you the perks of bonding two pieces of metal together. The only thing with the spot welder is everything has to be super, super clean. So we'll get that on, and that runs on 16 amp. It doesn't run on a 13 amp. It runs on a blue plug such as this. Now the spot welder I use is a Clark CSW 13T. These brand new, around 700 pounds. I bought this second hand for 500 off my friend, and it's a great piece of kit. So we'll show you what spot welding is. The only problem is the contacts have to be super, super clean, and so does the metal, and you can't go too quick with it because it does overheat and conk out. Now spot welding obviously is down to bonding two pieces of metal together, and as you can see, that ain't going anywhere. You've got the same penetration on that side and you have the same penetration on the other side. Spot welds, the key to them is if you get a spark when you do it, something's not clean. There should be no spark, it should just be a heat process that pulls the two pieces of metal together. All in all, a great bit of kit, great for around the door seams. It is very quick, but it also is very expensive, but it does save on having to grind down all those puddles of MIG weld. Um, if you're doing doorsteps and stuff like that. My mentality was I couldn't really afford to buy it, but I thought if I buy it, I can use it for what I need. And then once I'm done with it, I can always sell it because they hold the money really, really well. Obviously moving on from spot welds and welding as such, there comes clamps, you know, different rods, mole grips, the list goes on and on and on. And sadly, there isn't enough time to cover all that in this episode. So what I will say is if you want me to produce an episode on what I do when I'm welding and how you know I get the better of things, not a how-to guide as such, because I'm still learning myself, then I can certainly do that. The last question I answer before we end this video is about what I use to grind my welds down nice and flat. I tend to go for the typical flat disc. Flat discs, they're quite expensive, but the best thing about them is that they get a more newer one. They're really, really abrasive, and that's a 80 grit, and you can target the weld rather than targeting the panel, because the last thing you want to do is thin the metal around the weld. But all this can be covered on another episode, and if you want me to cover this on another episode, let me know, because obviously there'll be people asking, what are these blue clamps that I keep using? What is the difference between spot weld rods? Let me know in the comments if you want me to do a video about welding. Not a how-to, because I'm still learning myself, but I'd be more than happy to accommodate what I do to weld and how I've managed to improve my welds myself without actually going on any training courses as such. And I think that just about wraps up all the tools that I use in the garage. There's plenty and plenty of like sundries, fixings, gadgets and all that. If you want me to cover an episode on them, I will do. I might do one on welding and the things I use, not like a top tips because I'm still learning myself and I don't want to be passing on wrong information to people. And the other thing is, if you lot are interested in what I film the videos on, like such as this camera and this lens, let me know and I'll uh, be more than happy to shoot a video on how I make a TCR episode and how long it actually takes. This is probably the last time you're going to hear from me before Christmas, so I wish you all the best and all the best for New Year and I'll catch you very soon with some more updates on the TCR channel. Make sure you stay safe and do everything in style.